Well, hello, hello. I see you notice me, noticing that you notice me wear a hat. Yes, my hair's weird. Let's not talk about it. And I also know that uh, you've been thinking about making a little map of your own. Maybe. I don't know. Or maybe you're just here for fun. Use my partner code if you want to make a new account. Just saying if you're new, but me. Honest. I'll put it down below. I really appreciate it. But I want to talk to you guys about making a map. So what goes into it? I'm going to show you how to get to the editor because a lot of people aren't actually aware. It's so easy. You can either go right to this link at the Krunker editor. Or of course you can load up Krunker and do it the old fashioned way. Just go to Krunker.io. Log yourself in, click on the games section, and then click on the game editor. Perfect. We're all in the right place. So what do we do from there? Well, this is the map editor, okay? And the middle part of the screen is where you interact with what you're building. There's a couple of basic commands that we'll get into in a few moments, but at the very top has everything that you need to do to publish your map, spawn things in, do all of the god mode things in your map, okay? You have tools, you have AI, you have the basics, and some more advanced models in there. The file is like a, any Windows operation. Same with the edit. Components typically deal with the environment, the terrains, and the zones. And once you go down and click on those, you'll find on the right-hand side you're able to interact with those less used features. I'll brush over them for now just because we're going to have an intermediate guide coming out uh, in the next couple of days. Of course, you also have the ability to test your map and host your map from this and customize some of the more advanced details in the map, which we really won't get to for a little while with my advanced guide. So first things first, you need to know how to interact with the map editor. So by holding right click, you can move and look anywhere you'd like. And you move the same way you would as any FPS game, W, A, S, and D. That's how you're going to do the majority of interaction with the map editor and look around your objects, making sure things look good at different angles, getting at different objects in a higher or lower altitude, the basics. This should be fairly intuitive for everybody since we all play Krunker and we use pretty much the same controls except for the fact that you can right click uh, to move your camera in this basic uh, tutorial. On the left hand side you'll see things that specify the game mode when players are creating and hosting these lobbies. So you can specify the amount of players, the game modes that can be played on the default settings, the types of classes you can use, the overall settings for gravity, slides, auto jumping, fire rates, all these fun things, as well as anything and everything to do with the weapons. So if you wanted the sniper to do 50 damage, for instance, on a normal hit, you can do that. Or if you wanted to do 500 damage on a normal hit, you could do that. So let's get into the real meat and potatoes. How do we actually make the map? So if you start off just at the top by clicking object, going down to basic, and clicking on the option that says cube, we'll spawn in the most basic object in the game. If you see at the very upper left-hand corner of the middle portion, you'll have three different modes. The first one allows you to move things any way you'd like. The second one is a rotational tool, which I'm showing here, that allows you to rotate any object you'd like. Now for the basic guide, I would highly recommend staying away from the rotational tool because as you can see, I have it in red where the collidable part of the object stays. In Krunker, it will stay static, meaning that you actually will be moving the object in ways that you won't intend if you use the rotational tool, if you're a beginner player. You also have the third option, which is the stretching tool, is what I call it. Uh, it will make objects elongate on whichever side that you're dragging that square for the object. Now on the right hand side, you can actually specify uh, numbers for which way and which size and what position you'd like everything to be in. For this purpose, I'm just resetting everything back to zero for the rotation because Again, we shouldn't be using that in the beginning tutorial. So as you can see, I'm just stretching the cube out to a place where I feel comfortable that it will be a nice object in the game that I'm looking to make. In this case, we're going to make a very basic um, scoring system. So a, a almost like a hard point. 
Now you can see if I go into the texture on the right hand side while I have this selected, I can change the color and I'm making it green like grass. And I can also change the type of material to being grass by using that type selection. Now if I really wanted, I could change it and make it move, but we're gonna stay away from that one for this since we're just making grass. And you can also use some more advanced techniques about which side it renders on to make the map easier to view and things like this. We won't get into that for the tutorial either though. Now I have my patch of grass. I'm going to use in the lower left hand corner of my viewer to duplicate this piece of grass. At the top I'm going to use the movement tool and I'll move my grass over to the left because I'm going to be making a couple different platforms for this. Something I see a lot of beginner players do is this, and they will actually overlap their textures on the same pixel, so the same plane. That makes it really funky for players. If you've ever seen a map where pixels seem to be glitching in and out, it's because they did that. Very, very basic mistake. It happens a lot. Now I want three patches of grass because I'm going to have three layers uh, height-wise of my grass. So I duplicate it over again, and I take my middle go up to the top and I hit that stretching tool and I make the middle section a bit higher so there's some separation of vision between my two spawn points. So I'm going to go ahead, I go back up to object, I go to basic, I spawn in a cube because I want kind of like a flagpole so people know where they're standing. And I'm going to use that stretching tool to make a little bit of a, a flagpole base. I'll use my texture drop down and go into type to make it a floor. And then I'll stretch it up a little bit to make it look more like a flagpole. But I want a little bit more. So I'm going to duplicate that. And I'm going to stretch it down a little bit. I'm pulling it up. Give the flagpole a top. Maybe I'll add something to that later. Maybe I don't need it. But it's my map. So I do what I want. I'm going to go ahead and stretch out another piece. That's going to be the actual flag. Of course I want that to be a little bit different looking. So I go into the type on that. Change it to default. And I'll change that color to be red. One thing to note, when I'm stretching from the side on these objects, it actually will pull on both sides. So you have to make sure that you readjust these things and check on another side of a wall if you're actually expanding an object and don't want it to show through the other side of that wall. So now I have my flagpole made. I'm going to go down to the tools option and I'm going to spawn in a scoring cube. Now this is a little bit on the intermediate side of this tutorial, but this is actually very important to understand. That tools portion is going to be what furthers the game along. So when I go to a scoring zone, of course, that's going to give me score. On the right hand side, I can change what that score will be, but we're going to keep it at one for now. So I put it right around that flag because I want the enemy team to be getting points when they're standing in there. I don't want to remake the same thing on the other side of the map, so I'm going to get everything where I want it, and I'm going to use the option at the very top that says Group Selection. If you click that and turn it to On, all you have to do is select the items you want to group, meaning you're going to be moving them all at the same time. I'm going to go up to the top again and click Group Selection On to turn it to Off, because it's a toggle. I'm going to duplicate all of those items. And I'm just going to move them right onto the other side of the map for our other team. Everything's in place, but I want a little bit of separation between the teams. So I'm going to change this flag to blue. Beautiful. So I don't want a whole lot of groups in here. So I'll go up to object group. Stop all. I don't want any groups. And that's a useful tool because Groups can get kind of odd, so I wouldn't recommend it as a beginner to do them off the bat. I would make one group at a time if I need to copy something, but nothing more. So now I need to make sure that I have some type of interesting thing in the middle, because this would be a very boring map otherwise. So I go in and I use a trigger. Now triggers are very, very important, because what it means is when something happens to this trigger, something else happens as a result. Now, I won't go farther than that for the basic tutorial. We'll get intermediate later on and show you some cool things. And when we get to advanced, we'll be using them heavily. But understand that core concept. 
So I get my trigger to the appropriate size, location, and color. In this case, I want it to be green because green's a color that everybody likes, including myself, it's the best color. And I want to make it do something. So I go through and I say on the event that somebody holds their mouse on this target for a given amount of time, which I'm gonna put as one second, it is going to destroy another block. What block is that gonna be? Well, we have to give it an assigned value. So under interface, we'd make the target what that block's identifying number will be. And in this case, I'm going to make it one. I make a second trigger using duplicate and I make it look kind of like a hammer. Now, after that, I go through and I say when this is destroyed, because that's what our first trigger does, we are going to do something odd. What are we going to do? We're going to broadcast a message to the world, and that message is going to say, Ow! Could do anything. Now guys, on here, you have to make sure that the identifying number for this block is 1. How will we know that these are now connected for sure? We can actually lift up this trigger, and we'll see this red line. That'll let you know that these things are connected. And I'm going to make the action chance 100% because I feel like it. That part, not really required. Now we have myself a pretty good looking map. Now I have this map here and I think, hmm. You know what? I should have tested this map. I should have given it a little test run before I published it. All that you have to do then is go up to map, click test map, and we're in. But I'm just floating. <laughs> and why am I floating? because I never specified a spawn point. Spawn points are very important. You need to tell your players where they're gonna spawn and you know the conditions of that spawn. So I would go to tools and I'd put in a spawn point. Now the spawn point by default, we're gonna change it to team one because we want it to be two players uh, or two teams that fight and we're going to change its direction to be looking towards the other team. We're going to make that direction for the second team, team two, face towards the other team, which is team one. And we're going to resave that. And we're going to test it. And hopefully, we spawn on one side. Now, as you can see, we're now on that side. We have a playable map. There's our trigger. There's the other team. Things are looking good. So I'm going to go through. And as everybody should do before they do anything different, they should give the map a name. This map is going to be named insane underscore map because we cannot have spaces. And I'll go down and I will save it. So now I have this file. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to click publish. And all I would have to do in this case is click publish. But what do we do if we want to get back to that map in the future? Maybe we want to update it. Maybe we want to remove something. Maybe you backed out of the page and forgot about it. How are we going to get that data back? We want to go back to our downloads and open up our save file. All you have to do is copy everything in there, go up to file, click on import, and paste what you copied right into there. This will help you when you get into bigger maps that you'll be working on over the course of multiple days. Guys, this is a pretty good start. I think with these tools, you know, a very good start to how to make maps. And I will be releasing an intermediate guide soon to make some of those raid maps and other cool maps that you've been seeing from me. If you have any questions, any issues with map making, uh, or any comments, feel free to drop them below. And I wish you guys the best of luck. Feel free to let me know if you create some cool maps and we can try them out on stream sometime. I am live every day of the week, 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I can't wait to see you there. Have a great day.